Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. We also have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit filmflorida.creator-spring.com to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and more. Reed Martin is the author of the book, The Real Truth, everything you didn't know you need to know about making an independent film. The Real Truth details the challenges that aspiring filmmakers encounter while candidly describing how to spot and avoid issues and obstacles. We talk about Reed's background, his time in Florida, why he decided to write the book and the follow-up on this episode of the Film Florida podcast. Here's my conversation with Reed Martin. Welcome to the Film Florida podcast, Reed. John, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So let's kind of start at the beginning. What's your backstory? Where'd you come from? Well, you know, it's funny you ask because I'm originally from Florida. I was born at the Shands Hospital in Gainesville. And uh, after that, grew up in Miami. One of the early jobs I had was at the Miami Museum of Science, where they had the Pink Floyd laser show back in the day. Um, and I went to Gable Senior High School. Then I went to Georgetown for college. But uh, long before that, I had a job at haagen right across the street from the Riviera Theater on US-1. And so that was really my introduction to film, was just seeing uh, those audiences stream out of the theater every two hours and right into our our haagen and hearing about what they liked and disliked about the movies they had just seen. And now we're going to talk a lot about your book coming up, but I wanted to start a little bit more with, you know, you started your career kind of as an independent film reporter. What was that experience like and, and how did it prepare you for the, your following career moves that were, you know, involved in the film industry? Originally, I was an intern reporter at the Miami Herald after working for the Gable Senior High School newspaper, Highlights. Uh, so it had always been sort of a mountaintop that I had wanted to, to climb was to work as a, as a metro reporter at the Herald. And while I was doing that covering, uh, you know, sort of local news in, in, in the Gables and such, I also was writing on the side, I was writing a few entertainment pieces for the arts section. Usually, that would be covering bands that had come to Miami. But I also wrote one story in particular about a movie theater in the Kendall area that was closing. It was closing down for lack of uh, of audiences. And that was really kind of my first inflection point with the film business, if you will, because it was, you know, there was a theater that had its heyday back in the 50s, but now had, for whatever reason, had run into into trouble. And so that story actually and and what the challenges were on the exhibition side really kind of sparked an interest in the business side of the film industry uh, from where the rubber hits the road, which is where audiences go to the movies. So after that, um, I started writing more and more about entertainment. And ultimately, I became a freelancer for USA Today covering independent film. And I was able to attend uh, Sundance, the Sundance Film Festival, three times in 2001, 2003, and 2005, writing for, for USA Today covering that festival. And so that really kind of led to uh, all sorts of relationships and, and insights, one of which was that hearing the same mishaps and the same pitfalls and the same roadblocks and the same landmines on the road to Sundance, if you will, at the panel discussions that I was attending or the sort of Q&As that invariably happen after the film screens, I kept hearing sort of the same things that happen over and over again. I mean, yes, everyone laughs when you hear about how the electricity was shut off and people had their phone service shut off, et cetera. But there were also technical problems that people ran into and they were the same dozen or so issues. And so I mentioned mentioned actually to film producer Ted Hope, who I had struck up a friendship with, I said, you know, someone should really write a pamphlet or something or some <laughs> kind of a some kind of a compendium of all these uh, problems that even the biggest names in independent film had had run into. 
Um, you hear these rags to riches stories, but unless you're at the festival, you don't really hear about the the uh, the mishaps and the glitches and things. Um, and he said, well, you could never do that because it would have to be as big as the as the Manhattan phone directory. And so I set out to do that, actually. Mm -hmm. And my book, The Real Truth, Everything You Didn't Know You Need to Know About Making an Independent Film is actually a 540 page book covering all the possible mishaps that first and second time filmmakers run into as told by well-known filmmakers whom everybody has heard of and who everybody respects. That way it's not coming from me. I'm sort of teeing it up and I'm the sort of the emissary, if you will. But it's really the, the mishaps and, and problems and issues as told by established filmmakers, folks like Darren Aronofsky or Werner Herzog, names that, that, ever, that a lot of people who are in the space have heard of. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get into the book more, but before we do that, I have one other question about the kind of that free time. You worked as an MBA management trainee for 20th Century Fox International. How important was, was that time to focus on the marketing side and the business side of the industry? Well, I yeah, I got an MBA at Columbia in 1996. And uh, again, I focused on media and entertainment during that time. And one of the opportunities that I had was the 20th Century Fox film had a training program, a management trainee program for sort of junior executives where they would cycle you through the different departments of the studio and give you sort of a front row seat to each of the, uh, you know, how exhibition works and how marketing works and all the different the facets of, of the industry. And so it was a really exciting program. And it was especially exciting at the time in 1997 or so, 1997, 98, because international theatrical was really hitting its stride. This was after the sort of outsized success internationally of Independence Day. And so among the senior executives who I was working with and working for was Jim Giannopoulos. He had set up this really well-organized machine to make the most of international. He was one of the first executives to recognize that potential. And so instead of selling off rights, in many cases, uh, a lot of the, um, the revenue and the profits of films in that era were coming from international as audiences mm -hmm. overseas became more sophisticated and movie going became more of a habitual thing as nicer theaters came online overseas. And so, you know, focused on 26 international territories. It was just really a, an exciting time to work with the team that Jim had assembled. And the proof of his vision was that um, when it came to splitting the cost of Titanic with Paramount Pictures, 20th Century Fox film retained international distribution rights and, and the bulk of the revenue, more so than domestic, I think it was twice as much um, came mm -hmm. from international. And so that was really the proof that his vision was uh, the right one. Okay, so now let's, I, I want to jump really far into the book. So as you said, the name of the book is The Real Truth, Everything You Didn't Know You Need to Know About Making an Independent Film. It seems like it would be, a tr and it's 500 plus pages, as you mentioned, So, but it would seem like it would be a great asset for aspiring filmmakers. Of all of that, let's let's kind of start big picture. What's one piece of advice that you give somebody starting in the industry from the very beginning? The piece of advice I give people who are starting in the industry is to read the real truth. Uh, everything <laughs> you didn't know, you need to know about making an independent film. Yes, it's 540 pages, but you know it's available on Apple eBooks and and Kindle as well, so you can read it in any kind of format. But the book really touches on a lot of the pitfalls and roadblocks that people just don't consider because they assume that sheer force of will will carry the day. They have a vision, they have talent, they have a great script, they've uh, assembled a great team of production folks together, they may have a film degree or experience making videos either on TikTok or YouTube or Vimeo or any of the, you know, the, the sites that folks go to today, and they may have a natural aptitude for storytelling. They're probably really passionate about film in general and cinema, and they have favorite films that they love to quote that they saw years ago growing up, either with their folks or with older siblings. But the problem is that there are just so many issues that can blindside even the best filmmakers who everybody knows, including 
you know, Barbara Koppel, Ken Burns, uh, Perry Hensel, who directed the Jimmy Cliff classic, The Harder They Come, Kim Pierce, Jim Sheridan. Uh, again, I mentioned Werner Herzog and Danny Boyle, all folks who I quoted and who I spoke to directly uh, for The Real Truth. And so the advice that I have is that you may have incomplete information. It may, things may not work the way that you, it's really sort of, the classic line that I sort of wish I had, but it's, it came along a lot later, is from Mark Hamill in one of the recent Star Wars films. He says, this is not going to go the way that you think. And that's really sort of the theme of the real truth. And that's what I set out to help people kind of uh, get out ahead of. The advice I would have, if you had to distill it down to one one thing, though, I would tell people that it just takes a lot longer than you expect. The fundraising takes a lot longer Getting cast together, getting cast assembled takes a lot longer than people think. You know, the filmmaking process itself, you know, it could probably take twice as long. Post-production, people don't really allocate enough time for that. And so they just don't leave themselves enough time to achieve each component of the filmmaking process along the way. And so this one piece of advice sort of touches on all the different aspects that are in the real truth in the 15 chapters that I have, um, because time is, is, is really an issue. It's just something that people think that they'll be able to, uh, to, to achieve in a, in a certain interval, and, and very often it takes much longer than that. Yeah. And now the book includes uh, this passage from the first chapter, which I think is great. Independent filmmaking is all about struggle. The sooner independent filmmakers realize that Things are never going to be easy, the better equipped they will be to handle the setbacks and heartbreaks that go with every independent project. You mentioned the early career struggles of famous filmmakers. In learning about that, were there any specific ones that really surprised you that, that helped in the creation of the book? Because you think these are these are really accomplished filmmakers. Of course, they're they're successful. Did you learn about any of their struggles that you were just like, wow, I can't believe this person had these struggles when they started out? You know, John, a lot of the books that are out there about independent film production are really encouraging and optimistic. And that's important because you have to have that optimism to be able to make it through the trenches and get your film made. So it's really important to have that sense of purpose and that sense of focus. But what is lacking, or has been lacking rather, in the pantheon of books about film production is something that really focuses on the downside risk and on, on the problems that people can run into and on the problems that your favorite independent filmmakers have themselves run into. Not just so you can get out ahead of them, which is something I focus on in The Real Truth, but so that when they happen, if these issues happen to you or to the aspiring filmmaker in your family, they will know that uh, they're on the right track. Because if they're running into these issues, then, then they're definitely doing it. It's sort of Jurassic Park chaos theory. I'm sort of acting as the sort of the Jeff Goldblum character in everybody's ear saying, well, you're going to want to look out for this and you're going to want to look out for that. and You're going to want to prepare for these other things. To your question about the surprising setbacks of filmmakers who I myself respected and who I just wanted to hear their stories, um, I think the one that stands out among others is Perry Hensel, who was the writer-director of the Jimmy Cliff uh, classic, The Harder They Come. I think that's from 1973. I interviewed him by phone from Jamaica, and he told me how after the success of The Harder They Come, which is a classic that a lot of folks uh, have referenced and that inspired any music film since then, music biopic since then, has been inspired by that film in some ways. He ran out of money for his second film, and he talked about how he tried to start the production while he was still raising the funds. And because the money fell through several times and was, was uh, not guaranteed in others, um, his second film was never completed. It was completed eventually, but the tragedy is that the development house that was developing the negative for Perry Hensel's second film actually went out of business. And so his film negative went into a storage facility, which he was unable to to recover, and then it was lost mm -hmm. to the ages. And so wow. the, only, the only cut of his film that he had was a rough cut on VHS, which obviously is not the ideal medium. But 
Um, his advice was to make sure that you have all of your production funds. Some producers and directors will say you just have to strike while the iron is hot, and sometimes you just have to go for it uh, without all your production funds in place. Or perhaps you could rearrange your budget and make the you know the the really really ultra low budget version. And and there's some there's some truth to that. But you don't necessarily want to be raising money while you're in production because the fundraising effort for an independent film is a thing unto itself. I mean, it really is. Even running a GoFundMe campaign the right way, it takes an incredible amount of focus. And it's not something that someone who's an aspiring director or producer can do while the film is sort of, uh, you can't, they, people joke about paving the, the road while they're driving down it or, mm -hmm. you know, build, building the plane while you're at 30,000 feet. And, and those are, those sort of aphorisms are, are funny to, to joke about, but it's not something you want to, you don't want to find yourself in that situation, that position. And I really advise, you know, sometimes you need a fundraising effort to fund the fundraising effort because you right. need to have rent and you need to have food and you need to have something to live on while you're out there shaking the trees to, to get funding. And a lot of people don't consider that. Yeah. And now the book mentions that you interviewed over a hundred people from the independent film world. If you had to choose or are, are any of them, you know, specifically your favorite memorable, what, what are some of the, the good stories? Oh, well, there's there's so many there's so many stories that I would that I would encourage people to check up on. There's so many inspirational stories in the real truth. Everything you didn't know you need to know about making an independent film. Someone might say, well, this is a film that came out years and years ago, and so you know it's not valid today. But these origin stories, John, of people's favorite independent filmmakers, those never get old. They're still right. even even you know, years later, however long it is, those origin stories are still the same. And so that's probably the most inspirational part of the book, I would say. And to that point, in the first early chapters I have about struggle, among them is the story of Chris Ayer, who's the Native American director of the Miramax distributed indie film Smoke Signals, um, which was one of the earliest, very successful uh, Native American productions of the sort of the indie film heyday in, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. While he was nursing his independent film aspirations, he had a job for several for several seasons being on those fishing boats that you see on, on the Discovery Channel. And so, you know, he was out there doing that and he worked in uh, salmon canneries as well. And he talks about that experience. And it's just such a it's such a striking contrast that Chris Ayer, before he directed Smoke Signals, that he describes from working in a salmon cannery where his colleagues and friends, in some cases, had their fingers cut off by these giant, uh, you know, salmon cutting machines, if you if you weren't careful, and just being completely exhausted and then going back to his his modest, you know, apartment and staying up for hours writing screenplays. And that's something that a lot of people can relate to because they work their regular jobs and then they want to come home and either, you know, make short films on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram, but they have regular jobs. And so to rally yourself and to, you know, to drink some espresso and then follow your dreams after that is is a tall order. And it's mm -hmm. not it's not something that everyone that everyone can do. But you know, for everyone who thinks they have it rough and everyone who thinks that they themselves are struggling. Chris Ayer's interview, his narrative of working several seasons in, in Alaska on fishing boats, uh, getting frozen needles of ice, you know, uh, spraying all over him all day long, and then also working in the in the salmon canneries. That is just really roughing it. And he he just tells this incredible story of perseverance and drive and inspiration that allowed him to get through all of that and to finally become a film director and make it to Sundance and be uh, making films that were produced by Robert Redford in some cases. Yeah, that's great. Now, as we talked about, you have a, a really good background on the business side of things. And we've talked a little bit about, you know, some of these mistakes and pitfalls and challenges of actually making the film. But from the, the, the business perspective, outside of the fundraising thing, what are some of the tips that, you know, uh, you always like to highlight from the book? John, you know, one of the tips among you know, hundreds of tips in the real truth that I that I really like to underline, and I think that are important. They may fly in the face of what a lot of filmmakers think is is how things are done. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot of myths that I, in talking to well-known filmmakers, try to modulate or even uh, just discourage or dismantle. And among those, there are several that I'd like to mention. I mean, you know, palming your script on somebody in the street 
there's a dream and an aspiration that that's the way to go. And it, it has worked. And I cover, I actually interview the filmmakers who have been able to pull that off, but that's not something that's not mm. a, a business model. That's not how yeah. you can't, that's, you can't carry your dog eared screenplay around in a satchel and expect that you're going to run into somebody at a grocery store, either in New York or Los Angeles. So that's the first thing. The second thing is having a lawyer as part of your core production team, it sounds very expensive. I mean, a lot of filmmakers will spend thousands of dollars on uh, video cards for their computers and such, or on uh, GoPro cameras or the latest red camera, or depending on how much of a budget they have, but they won't spend money on consulting an attorney. And they say, what's more expensive than, than legal advice? No legal advice mm -hmm. is more expensive because ultimately, you know, aspiring filmmakers and aspiring producers are going to make a misstep or a mistake that's going to cost them. And where that usually comes into play is in promising somebody the moon for their participation or uh, for coming aboard the project. And, and sort of the idle chatter can be interpreted as an oral contract. And so a lot of times people are uh, either willy-nilly offering uh, pay or play agreements to actors who may not be worth uh, doing that. In fact, in most cases, pay or play agreements are not, are not warranted. Or they may be promising people uh, points in the film for, to participate. Uh, they may be so excited to have someone who they think has their miracle, if you will, at least say, who's got my miracle, my miracle ticket uh, at a concert. Um, if you were going to buy a scalp ticket, um, mm -hmm. not so much anymore, but people are so excited about making films, uh, making a feature rather, that they often sort of fall in with the first or second person they meet. And there's a whole section in The Real Truth where I talk about the wrong producer. And in this case, uh, Kim Pierce, who directed Boys Don't Cry, has a sort of a whole section of the first chapter on struggle where she talks about how she fell in with somebody who was, quote unquote, the wrong producer. And her first film never got made. Before mm. before she was able to make Boys Don't Cry with Christine Vachon and Eva Kalodner producing years later, uh, she had a film that that never saw the light of day. And that's one of the most incredible things about the real truth. Uh, when I was doing the interviews, I found out that a lot of well-known filmmakers, including folks like Chris Nolan and others, had first films that were never seen or never heard right. of or never completed. It's not so much that Chris Nolan, who's a quoted source in, in the real truth, people think that his first film was Memento but he had a very low budget film before that called Following, um, which people are still discovering now and then on, on streaming. Um, but he actually had a film before that that was not completed, I believe. So that's one of the things where it's really important to get out ahead of these pitfalls and roadblocks that I cover and that I interviewed well-known filmmakers to, to help describe. I mean, one of the memorable snapshots that is inspirational was Ken Burns, of course, the documentary filmmaker. He he talks about how the uh, he knew that his electricity, I believe, had been shut off or something like that, or he was working, he was living in a drafty house in Maine when he was working on his first couple of films. And he said that he looked over and he said that ice had formed in a glass on his mm. bedside table because his, his <laughs> house was so cold. And I mean, you know, this is real. I mean, of course, now Ken Burns is a titan of documentary right. filmmaking, but, um, you know, he had a rough, he had a rags to riches story of his own. And so, again, these are not stories that are meant to be negative or to discourage people from following their dreams. In fact, these origin stories are designed to be inspirational. And so if you can, you know, if you can follow in your favorite filmmaker's footsteps, but avoiding the landmines and roadblocks that they themselves ran into, then you'll have an easier time of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting you talk about the legal side of things. I mean, we did uh, a panel discussion uh, in, in the past. And uh, you know, somebody I think asked the question, well, what do I do if I can't afford legal, you know, on my, my team? And, and one of the lawyers just kind of leaned in and said, you can't afford to not have legal on your team. And, and it really is true. You know, John, there is one thing that people can do to ramp up on what they need to know so they know what questions to ask and they can limit their billable hours with an attorney by checking out a book like Contracts for the Film and Television Industry by Mark Litwack. That is a terrific book that every aspiring filmmaker should own, along with The Real Truth, of course. But Contracts for the Film and Television Industry is a really important book. Again, the author is Mark Litwack. And, and the reason is because it just opens everyone's eyes to what appropriate contracts actually look like. So people shouldn't grab some PDF off the internet that, you know, that they don't know the, uh, the pro you know, the province of. Um, these are actual contracts that are have been vetted 
in this book, and and also people will know what questions and what they are going to run into. Also, you know, I have a full chapter on on legal issues as well that talks about um, all kinds of problems, and the biggest one I think that's the most important possibly for your listeners is when it comes to music rights that's something that trips yep. up every single aspiring filmmaker because very often they put together a playlist either on spotify or you know in the old days you would burn yourself a cd or even make a mixtape uh, back in the day of the songs that you want to have in your film and even especially the songs that you want to have in your credit roll because of the mm-hmm. you know the that's just some just imagine closing your eyes and imagining the credits going by to the song that sort of sums up your project is something that keeps people warm at night through the dark times and i totally understand that but the problem is that you cannot include well known essentially well known f- songs in your film with the expectation that you're going to get festival clearance rights and that the acquiring distributor will suddenly wave a magic wand and pay for all of the music rights that you have and 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 that's a real issue because you know tom bernard who's one of the co-presidents of sony pictures classics uh discusses in the real truth how distributors do not pay for outsized music rights and sometimes it's impossible to you know have the songs taken out of the film because either the emotional resonance of a certain song is what is you know makes the film work or a certain theme throughout the project or or just that the film has been cut to a certain track and so you know having to open it up uh, and and perform major surgery and replace that song with something something else is is hugely problematic and deals as discussed in the real truth deals have been broken distribution deals have been broken and filmmakers have been dropped because of music rights that haven't been cleared it essentially creates a sort of a mini subprime mortgage crisis if you will Mm -hmm. um in the independent film space because when the conversations and the discussions are coming up for delivery for you know for the project that has been acquired you know the big sort of publisher's clearinghouse check that everybody is expects to get at a film festival is actually not distributed or not you know the the check isn't sent until all the delivery items are accounted for and among those delivery items is uh, rights clearances for all the music and so even though yes there are instances where somebody knew bruce springsteen or bono or whomever it is i guess the best example of this would be sting providing songs for leaving las vegas to mike figgis it's just not possible for most aspiring filmmakers to afford, you know, a $30,000 song or some, in some cases, a $500,000 song, which they had their heart set on since they first typed fade in on a, on a blank page. Right. No, no doubt. Now you also do a lot of teaching. So is the book the basis of your educational lectures or is that, are they kind of separate? Well, the real truth is actually not included in the classes that I teach. Um, <laughs> the courses I teach are, are marketing, distribution, and exhibition courses. And the idea of the classes that I've taught at, at Columbia Business School and at uh, NYA Stern School of Business, they're really focused more on if you everyone has a favorite film and if you can market that favorite film of yours and you can use well-established best practices to market that film, you can then sort of extrapolate out to the categories that the MBA students uh, whom I've taught for probably about nine years in New York from 2001 to 2009, you can extrapolate out to the, to the categories where those MBAs will probably end up, whether that's pharma or uh, apparel or automotive or you know even experiential products or, or consumer packaged goods. There are very cutting edge and well-established film marketing best practices for identifying a primary and secondary audience, the seven or eight ad impressions that you need to create unaided awareness. And so a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the best practices I learned working at, at 20th Century Fox Film International are really applicable. You might not think that this is true, but they're really applicable to most other product categories, especially because the film business is willing to innovate in a lot mm-hmm. of areas where other categories would not. In fact, most recently, I was going through uh, the airport, DC National, and I saw that Renfield had put uh, movie marketing messaging, and including the one sheet, right in the bins that you go through TSA to put your shoes and your laptop in. And so that historically had been blank marketing real estate, but somebody had the idea, hey, let's use that. Let's put an ad there. And they even had taglines and cut lines from the movie, worst boss ever, or something like that for the, for the film Renfield. 
on the sides, on the sides of the handles, so that there was more than one ad impression, even from just standing around waiting in line to go through TSA. So that is really brilliant. And sort of that's the application. If if the film industry is willing to sort of explore any avenue for creating that fifth and sixth ad impression, uh, so too can consumer product uh, goods category companies as well. Interesting. And now within the first chapter of your book, you describe the technological advances that defined indie filmmaking in kind of the late 2000s. What technological or industry advancements do you encourage indie filmmakers to pay attention to for the next five to 10 years? Well, the real truth, because, you know, it came out when it did, it was focused really on the innovations of 4K and 8K high definition cinema. And so the focus really at that time was bringing less expensive, high definition video to independent filmmaking and making the transition from shooting in in 16 or super 16 or even 35 in some cases. And so that was really the innovation at the time. A lot of the best practices that I discussed in The Real Truth are still valid regardless of the cameras that have come around since then. It's not really obsolete. You still need to shoot reverse angles. You still can run into phantom reverb if if you're shooting in a giant open space. A lot of people don't spend money on sound. That is still a chronic problem. They don't scout their locations for sound. And so because they don't do a scout ahead of time, when they get to a location that they have their heart set on, you know, it might be uh, in the path of a local airport or there might be construction going on or there might be sirens from a local hospital. People always say waiting for sound, holding for sound. So all of those issues, regardless of the evolution of the technology, um, are still valid. What I would say is things have gotten a lot better since The Real Truth came out. You no longer have to go to a production house and spend, you know, $2,000 for a weekend to rent a fancy camera. You can go to Best Buy and for seven ninety nine, dollars you can buy a 4K camcorder. I mean, that shoots in 24P, which was something that used to require a production house. Not only that, you can buy three of them, essentially, and then you own those cameras and you can shoot wide, a master and a close up simultaneously for under, you know, say under $3,000, not to mention, you know, stabilization software, which was not a thing back then. And also with the ability to, to shoot in 24P to have that sort of more cinematic look than the historical 30 frames a second. So the evolution of technology has only made it more accessible and easier for just about anyone to get their hands on the equipment. I would say, John, to your question, the advice I would have for for people more recently is that there's an incredible amount of narrative storytelling going on on Instagram, on TikTok, on YouTube, on Facebook, all these sort of short form narrative expressions are a great training ground for for filmmaking on a grander scale on a bigger canvas. And what's amazing is just some people are so good at it. I mean, there's a short film on on YouTube that I would send everyone to, which is called Validation. And it's about a guy who validates parking uh, Mm -hmm. in a parking in, in, in a mall. But he also provides people he has an eye for for people and he provides people with personal validation as well it's black and white it's a short film it's terrific i mean it is just it's a terrific north star for folks to to see what's possible in terms of a short form narrative but then there's also layla the boxer on tiktok and on on instagram who's telling in 60 seconds stories that have a, a beginning and a middle and an end that are hilarious and well done and the filmmaker who is behind Layla the Boxer on Instagram and TikTok is also doing everything right in terms of shooting reverse angles, in terms of shooting establishing master shots. I mean, in terms of filming the geometry of where the characters who are her two dogs who get up to various mischief in terms of where the characters are in the room in relation to each other. And a simple pan can establish that, but that's something that a lot of filmmakers who perhaps didn't go to film school, that's something that they forget to do, or they don't have the patience for, or they Mm -hmm. don't have the patience to record room tone. 
Um, so there are a lot of things that I cover in The Real Truth, which may seem tedious or they want to move on to the next shot, but that are important in terms of making the film seem more professional, even if it's only going to live and reside on, on, on TikTok or Instagram. So um, despite the fact that the book came out uh, several years ago, a lot of these sort of film grammar and technology issues are still valid, regardless of whether you're shooting in 4K or you're shooting today in 8K. Right, because ultimately, in the end, the, the technology is less important than the story that you're telling and, and how you're telling it. That's right, John. And in fact, a lot of things are going the other way. People are going back to vinyl and people are going much more lo-fi. And so even though these incredible tools are available and you can, you know, you can get your hands on a lot of really fancy gear, a lot of times it's shooting handheld. It's a lot of times it's shooting on an iPhone 14 and authenticity is really what you're going for. It's not so much the technology and it's not so much the fancy equipment and the lack of grain from not mm -hmm. shooting in, in 16 millimeter. And people are willing to embrace that. People are willing to look past lower fi technology because what they want is that they want that authenticity and they want something relatable and something that speaks to them and something that's funny. I mean, that's a saying that goes back to old Hollywood in the 1940s. Funny is funny. And if you <laughs> have a knack for storytelling, um, you know, it really doesn't matter what you're shooting on. And, and that should not be the obstacle to people telling their stories and embracing their dreams of making their films. And the real truth is one way to act as a guide, because, again, even the most talented filmmakers, the most talented aspiring filmmakers, sheer force of will is not enough to carry the day. There are things that can just bowl people over and prevent their films from ever being seen. One thing people forget to do is they forget to clone their edit decision list, you know, or they forget to clone their master footage. They won't spend, you know, another $200 to buy a, a third or a fourth hard drive to have a third backup, or they create single points of failure along the way by keeping all their gear in, in one truck or in one apartment. Issa Rae famously you know, was an independent filmmaker before the HBO series Insecure. Her apartment was broken into and they stole all of her production equipment, her editing equipment and her, her cameras and everything else that she had assembled, this sort of edit bay in her apartment. And along with that went someone's independent film that she had been asked to edit. And so mm -hmm. some, unfortunately, uh, someone's first independent film dream went along with all that lost gear. And that might have been enough to bowl somebody over that they would not have the drive or the tenacity to stick with it as this array did and to become the storyteller and filmmaker and director that she is today. And that's the thing. There are these types of colossal crushing disappointments that can can prevent people from from achieving their dreams. Well, and, and one of the things you talk about is the importance of sustaining yourself in the face of rejection. To speak to that point a little bit for the listeners. I mean, I always use the, the sports analogy in me is that, you know, a major league baseball player can fail three out of 10 times at the plate and be a Hall of Famer because they got, you know, they batted 300. But that's failing seven out of 10 times. Filmmaking is, is very similar. And dealing with kind of the mental health side of things is also really important as an independent filmmaker. You know, John, sustaining yourself while trying to nurture your independent film dreams is just one of the toughest things there is. It is mm -hmm. so difficult. And in the real truth, uh, I spoke to so many filmmakers who, who address that problem. Among them, Jim Sheridan who went on to direct In the Name of the Father, My Left Foot, The Boxer, Get Rich or Die Trying, and, and a, a number of, of films that are viewed as, as classics of, of that era. And he talked to me in The Real Truth about how he had a job uh, mopping floors and cleaning toilets. He said he took the toilet cleaning assignment because it paid more. And he had a family mm. to sustain in New York in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it took him years of working this menial job while he was the great Jim Sheridan, just undiscovered. And while he was directing plays and writing screenplays at night with a family, this is um, what he documents in his autobiographical film in America, a lot of those, those early struggles, but it's tough. It is really tough. Um, you know, Werner Herzog uh, talked to me about all kinds of day jobs that he had. And and that's the, the struggle of it all is that you could be, you know, the renowned epic director Werner Herzog, but you're working odd jobs while you're trying to get the financing together. I mean, it is just really tough. And so that's one of the things 
that people have to come to terms with. And that's also why it takes much longer to raise the funds as it does. People have to be ready for that. They have to have on-ramps and off-ramps to their filmmaking dreams. Um, and, and if they're delayed for a time because they have to save up their finances or because they've been uh, hit with a hardship or or just the, the you know, the challenges, the day-to-day -day challenges of life, you know, they have to not give up on their dreams and not give up on their aspirations, but try to figure out how to make micro progress. I mean, that's one of the things I talk about in the book, how you can make incremental micro progress and how that is valid. Mm -hmm. You know, you're one step closer. Every book that you read about independent filmmaking, you're one step closer to getting there. Every video that you make for a social media platform um, you're learning the film grammar, every festival that you can go to, panel discussion. I mean, there are a lot of things these days which make it a lot easier because there's there, there are a lot of YouTube tutorials. There's, uh, you know, you can stream uh, Q&As from, from a, a lot of your favorite filmmakers and from festivals as well. And you can sort of pick up in sort of the ambient halo effect of going to meetup.com groups or joining the local film festival like the Austin Film Society here in Austin. Um, you can immerse yourself in, uh, you know, uh, affiliate groups or friendships and other hangouts where you can pick up tips and build uh, relationships that will will help with your productions and with your with shorts and things like that. And and so I would emphasize micro progress as opposed to the big epic swing where somebody is going to knock it out of the park and make a home run. I think that's the problem that trips a lot of people up, a lot of aspiring filmmakers and aspiring screenwriters as well, is that they think that there's one person who's going to finance their entire film, or there's one inflection point that's going to lead to their film getting made. And that leads to a lot of sacrifice and a lot of uh, hasty decisions because invariably either they're running into the wrong producer or things are going to take a lot longer than they expect. And so if you have that extended timeline, you're not going to sacrifice your significant other and your important relationships for the chance, if you will, mm -hmm. of getting your film made. A lot of people will, are willing to like roll. They've sacrificed so much and they have such an escalation of commitment and they have so much on the line that when it appears that the chance to make their film has finally arrived, they're willing to like sacrifice everything and everyone. And that's yep. a mistake because it can take a lot longer than people expect. And there are a lot of blind alleys. And so people should should not necessarily mortgage their lives and their credit cards and their finances and everything else because now their ship has come in or because this is it this is destiny calling we must seize the tide as you know or or lose our ventures it's it's not like that it's not like that there are uh, there are a lot of false starts and uh micro progress is you know it's it, it's sort of the tortoise and the hare and slow and steady can win the race yeah that that's a good point so as we wrap up, I, I, where, uh, I know we've, we've mentioned the book a little bit in this discussion, but I want you to, to make sure you give the, the title again and tell people where they can buy the book and where they can learn more about you in the book and, and give us all that information for people listening. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak to your audience today, John. I really appreciate it. Um, once again, I'm Reed Martin. I'm the author of The Real Truth, Everything You Didn't Know, You Need to Know About Making an Independent Film. Uh, it was published by Macmillan, and it includes interviews with 100 well-known filmmakers and producers from the independent and specialized filmmaking space. And it really is a chance for people to sit down with film executives. I mean, if nothing else, the real truth is a chance to sit down with well-known film executives like Nancy Utley and Steve Galula, who were the uh, executives who were running Searchlight during its most successful era. Um, Bob Burney, who distributed, you know, iconic independent films like Greek Wedding and so many others, The Passion, I mean, you name it, Bob Burney was really involved in a lot of the home runs of the independent film heyday. And, and also other producers like Christine Vachon and, and documentary filmmakers as well to really sort of ask the questions that they would ask if they had, you know, 10 minutes to talk to them. And it's available. The real truth is available 
probably mostly on amazon.com or on barnesandnoble.com. It's also available as an Apple ebook. So you can read it on your computer screen or you can read it on your phone or you can read it on your, on your tablet. And it's also on, on Kindle, of course. But I think among the best digital versions of it, the Apple ebook probably looks the best for some reason. It has that sort of page turn function. It's also available at some specialty bookstores and at some Barnes and Nobles, but probably Amazon is the best way to go. So Reed, after the success of the first book, is there another one coming and, and what's next for you and, and where can people get in touch with you? Uh, folk can, can reach out to me at reedmartin at live.com. That's a Microsoft Live account. It's Reed, R-E-E-D, M-A-R-T-N, Reed Martin at live. Uh, and I'm actually, uh, thanks for mentioning it, I'm working on a follow-up uh, to The Real Truth, which I'm hoping will be completed this summer. It's going to cover all new pitfalls and roadblocks, and it's going to also uh, focus on short-form content for Instagram and TikTok and other social media platforms, and how uh, storytelling in that in that arena has really exploded. I mean, one of the things that I predicted in the first chapter of The Real Truth is that filmmaking is going to be ubiquitous as soon as the equipment becomes democratized. And that has happened. I mean, anyone now these days with, you know, with an iPhone can actually download software to shoot in 4K on their phone and can also shoot in 24P. So, I mean, those are sort of the two elements that historically were the high hurdles that you had to go to a production house or a rental house uh, to be able to get for for sort of a Sundance qualifying independent film. Now that people are, are, are embracing authenticity and not so much focused on the visual aspect, the sound always has to be good. The sound has to be pristine. But 4K filmmaking is within reach for just about everybody these days, and especially folks who have the latest iPhone, which which has that capability. So uh, once again, I'm I am working on a second a second book, and uh, I even have a GoFundMe page up and running. But uh, folks can reach out to me directly at readmartin@live.com. Well, uh, Reed, we we sincerely appreciate you spending the time with us today, and of course, uh, sharing your expertise. We really appreciate you being on the Film Florida podcast. Thanks so much for having me, John. And I just want to encourage everyone out there to follow their dreams. And I hope to see them at a festival someday, speaking in a panel discussion about the roadblocks they were able to avoid. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at filmflorida.creator-spring.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.